into class here in um, just a few seconds. So I assume that it's up to me when we start, right? Or is there any more buttons that needs to be pushed? <laughs> I was told it was just one here, and I, I, I already did that. <clears throat> See, if you're like, like a guy like me, I think that the hourglass is cutting edge technology, you know? <laughs> then uh, when, you, when something like this is put in front of you, it's like, ooh. Um, so um, really great to be here. Thank you. I believe this is the um, uh, theme for today. Great, uh, I call it Greater Grace Doctrinal Distinctives, the anointing. And I, I believe that we're going to start with a clip. Is that correct? Cody, is that correct that we're going to start with a clip? Okay, yeah, so I, I think we do it first, and then uh, I'll say a few things there. So please go ahead. <clears throat> One of the most obvious problems that's in the world today is not understanding the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is so easy to communicate without communion. To interpret without inspiration. And to express without manifestation. And to have the means of truth through knowledge without motivation. But in every single thing that we attempt to do, there has to be the anointing of God. Jesus Christ, the Word of God says... In Acts 10.38, anointed of the Holy Spirit, went out doing good and healing all manner of diseases and everyone that was oppressed of the devil. What is an anointing? Now, every single person has an anointing that is born again, as you know. In 1 John 2.20 and 2.27, from Ephesians 1.14 and 4.30, sealed when we were saved. But how does that anointing operate in business, conversations, practical dialogues, social friendships? How does that anointing literally, actually, precisely work. First of all, a person has to really, without any provision for normality, without any provision for practicality, a person has to really understand what the anointing is. And the most practical thing in the world is to communicate knowledge without the anointing zeal or have the zeal without the knowledge in Romans 10.2. Honor and majesty and strength and beauty are in the sanctuary in Psalm 96.6. He looked at the pillars and then he looked at the magnificent needlework of the temple. He saw the cherubims and their beautiful handiwork. And he saw the strong walls that went up high. But these walls, which were very strong with the pillars, were very beautiful. And he said, you can have strength and still be beautiful, and you can be beautiful and still have strength. And he said, that's how the temple is. He said, there's also honor and majesty in the temple. Honor that 
or someone esteems something highly precious and majesty a certain holiness. And the word majesty, anointing, is synonymous with majesty. So honor and majesty and strength and beauty are in the temple. Often when Jesus said he came with grace and truth, it is very easy when trials and troubles come to have the truth. And I've experienced it personally. To be able to experience the truth, and then I find out I need grace badly. Because it takes the grace to be relaxed, operating in truth under pressure, in afflictions, and in trials. And so, this principle of the anointing, the word grace is also synonymous when it's Jesus Christ with the anointing. And also in the Isagoges, truth is synonymous. That is God's truth with the anointing. Wow. <clears throat> Great thoughts, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Um, we're going to continue to speak about uh, the um, anointing. So, Lord, we pray that you bless these things. Thank you for this clip. Thank you, Lord, for these thoughts. Thank you for this truth that we just heard. And uh, we pray, Lord, that these thoughts now will be uh, complementing what we just heard and uh, that we will learn something uh, something about your word, something about your truth as you has, have revealed it uh, through your word in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So, Greater Grace Doctrinal Distinctives, the anointing, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, we're going to, you know, a biblical approach to the uh, doctrine of anointing. So, I, I was thinking we, we're just going to go through some very uh, maybe basic things, but, you know, sometimes that is very good. And then at the end here, we're going to try to tie it all together and, and uh, look at it a little bit from uh, our ministry's perspective, if you will. So um, the two verses here that we do find in the uh, uh, New, T New Testament about the anointing, we, we find, find them in um, 1 John. Uh, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. That's verse 20, 1 John chapter 2. And uh, it doesn't say so much about it. You know, we just say we, we have an anointing. But then um, in verse 27, we get some more information. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. So these are the only clear passages uh, in the New Testament speaking about the anointing. There are some references, of course, in the Gospels. And the word here is uh, charisma in the Greek, and uh, it's used only three times. And uh, all these three times you find here I have highlighted in their anointing once in, in verse 20 and twice in verse 27. So therefore, when we're dealing, when we're dealing with this doctrine, we, we need to go uh, to the Old Testament in order to find more information about what it is. And um, in the Old Testament, uh, we find two types of anointings. Uh, one is what we call the common anointing, and the other one is the ceremonial anointing or ritual anointing. Uh, so we have different uses. We have, first of all, the medical, preservative, and uh, cosmetic reasons. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel 16.9, uh, it was for, you know, to protect the skin. It was applied after a bath in Isaiah 1.6, which is probably a familiar verse for many of you. Uh, it's used for balm to put on wounds. Uh, in 2 Samuel 1.21, uh, we see how they used it for their shields, the soldiers. Uh, they were anointed to keep them from drying out. But then also uh, corpses were anointed before burial. Uh, in uh, Luke 23 and verse 56, uh, we find uh, actually 
in, in connection with the death of Jesus there, that, you know, the, the body was anointed with oil. And then we have a third use here. Uh, when a guest would come uh, to someone's house, uh, that person would be anointed, their head would be anointed uh, as a sign of respect. And we find that, of course, in Luke 7, 20, 46, Luke 7, 46, where uh, a Pharisee had invited Jesus to his home, and Jesus said, you did not anoint my head uh, with oil, but this woman did. And we know that that woman most likely uh, was Mary, if we read John uh, chapter 11, verse 2. So these are some of the uses uh, that we find there uh, that would be the common use. And then uh, we have the ceremonial anointing uh, of things. Uh, objects were anointed. For example, in Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 to 33, we see how the tabernacle itself was actually anointed. Uh, the Ark of the Testimony, of course, it was inside there. The altar of incense, the laver, the utensils, everything was anointed. And it was symbolized being set apart for service uh, to God. So, so uh, that, is, that was a ceremonial uh, anointing. Not only objects were uh, anointed, but also people. And uh, there were three people, or three categories, you may say, uh, that were anointed. The prophets, uh, we read about that <clears throat> in um, how Elijah told, was told to anoint Elisha. You find that in uh, 1 Kings 19 and verse 16. We see how the priests were anointed. Uh, Aaron and his sons were anointed in Exodus chapter 29. A very detailed description of that found there. And then, of course, kings. Uh, Saul was anointed by Samuel. We read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. And David was also anointed by Samuel a little later in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. So this took place at the initiation of a person's ministry. Uh, it occurred only once. You say, well, well, David was anointed twice. It's true. He was anointed first uh, as the king of Judah. Uh, and then later, uh, all the tribes embraced him as their king, and he was anointed again. But, uh, but normally, it was just once. Um, so, now, the significance of, um, this is in Exodus 29, 21, uh, and you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle, sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed. This is the New King James. Uh, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. So the significance of this ceremonial anointing was uh, that they were connected to being, or is connected with being set apart to the service of God at the beginning of uh, a ministry. So this really corresponds to our positional sanctification. And uh, in the New King James, it's you, the word hallowed is used there, but you're probably more uh, used to the word consecrated. Uh, and here we have the Hebrew word kadash. Uh, it's equivalent to the Greek word hagios, and it simply means to be uh, set apart to God. So objects were set apart, tabernacle and many other things, but also people, uh, the prophets, the kings, and uh, the um, uh, pr priests. Okay. Um, also, the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were considered to be prophets. And um, that was kind of in a broader sense. But uh, if you read Psalm 105, we see that that is the case. Uh, and they were God's anointed. Uh, we also read about it in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7. And uh, in Psalm 105, it speaks about them as God's chosen people. And uh, he's warning the nations not to interfere with God's program. 
that is being carried out by these chosen individuals. So in, in application, uh, the anointing is like for all people, and uh, it's, it's not just born-again New Testament believers, but uh, it, it, it's any, any person doing the work of God, you know, the patriarchs, the prophets, and, and so on. And uh, it says, do not touch God's anointed. And of course, we have uh, heard that, and, and of course, some televangelists are, are using that uh, verse a little bit out of context. You know, if you say anything against their ministry, even if they're false teachers, you know, you're in trouble because you touch God's anointed. But we are hopefully a little bit more balanced than that, and uh, we understand that, that it, it's not necessarily, uh, should not be applied that way. But at the same time, you know, it, do not touch God's anointed. They were not to touch Abraham's uh, descendants you know, as they were coming into the promised land. It was a warning, you know, and of course there is, in a, in, in a more general sense, also uh, a warning to, to all people that, you know, God has His people and, and uh, we should not, people should not interfere with what God is doing in this world. Okay, uh, so what exactly was the anointing then? Uh, it was the physical act of pouring oil on an object or a person's head. We already kind of said that. Um, but it was also a ceremonial or ritual act designed to describe or portray a spiritual reality that now these people were set apart. So in the New Testament then, we have the spiritual reality that the anointing portrays. And uh, this is about being set apart they all, it's not a political message, by the way, uh, in case you thought that it was it's just a coincidence, the colors. Uh, <laughs> I, you never know. You never know. So I, I better, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you never know what you're running into. And, and by the way, in Sweden, it's the opposite. The conservatives are the blue ones, and the red ones are, are the liberals. So, so, so. Uh, so it, it, it works the other way around there. Uh, so, <laughs> so the ceremonial anointing therefore symbolized being set apart for divine service. And consequently, it also speaks of the appointment to a specific role. You know, we saw the, the role of uh, the prophet, the role of the priest, the role of the king, and so on. So in application, this takes us away from the post-salvation filling ministry of the Holy Spirit and even his teaching ministry. So, in other words, you know, sometimes we have this idea about the uh, uh, anointing that it is maybe like an ongoing thing, but when we study it this way, we know that it, it was really an initial act. Uh, it was something that took place only once in the beginning of somebody's ministry. So, this rather refers to what happened at the instant of salvation. Uh, and that is a non-repeated action, if you will. Okay, um, here's a familiar place. Um, last, yesterday I was walking around here. I took the picture over the fence. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Shala said, when they put the fence there, he said, it's not a problem, you know, nobody will even notice that. And then I... <laughs> The <laughs> first one to point it out, you know, there's a fence around. It's a gated communi community now, uh, you know, and uh, I think it's good, though, but, but I had to walk around it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, so the anointing occurs once at the beginning of a ministry. Uh, at the point of salvation, every believer enters into full-time service. Uh, it may not be professional service like uh, a pastor or a missionary or, or, or anything like that or a paid position in a church, but every New Testament believer is in full-time service from the point of salvation. Because in, he, uh, sorry, in uh, 1 Peter 4.10, it says that we have been given at least one gift with which we are to serve one another. So the the reason I'm using this picture is that this building is full of anointed people, uh, full of people who are born again, who have been set apart for service to God. 
So the anointing relates to positional truth. That's what we have concluded so far uh, to what happens at the inception of our Christian life at, uh, uh, sorry, at the in inception of our Christian life at salvation. Um, so this reminds us of the Pauline uh, teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is our initiation into the body of Christ. We read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. We also read about the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 6, 19. Uh, in other words, you know, when we are baptized into the body of Christ, this is where we are we become anointed. Now we are in that place, you know, uh, the initial stage of, of our ministry, and we are being equipped. So these two facets of the Holy, Holy Spirit's ministry to the church age believer relates to our positional sanctification. So I promised that we would return to these two verses because these are, like I said earlier, the only two verses that are... Uh, actually uh, telling us anything specifically about the anointing. And um, clearly it seems to have the idea of not simply our positional relationship, but it has some, it's somehow connected to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, people have read these verses, of course, like, and they think that it means that, okay, uh, I'm anointed, so I don't need a teacher, uh, I, I don't need anything. I know all things automatically. That is not what it means. Uh, but in that case, you wouldn't be here this morning. In that case, you wouldn't go to church. In that case, you wouldn't sign up for, for Bible college and so on. But because of our position in Christ, we have been given the potential to understand the whole counsel of God. But it doesn't it does not mean that we automatically understand it. So, outside of, um, well, let's read it here first. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And then the verse goes on here. But I just wanted to point out here that He has anointed me and then notice also that it says that he has sent me. So the anointing is connected with the sending. And outside of 1 John chapter 2, um, verses 20 and 27, when we find that term, uh, it refers to Jesus' messianic ministry during his incarnation. And Luke uh, 4, verse, verses 18 and 19 actually which is a quote, by the way, from Isaiah 61.1, uh, really speaks about this thing. Uh, and anointing and being sent seem to be comparable notions here, uh, and they have to do with the Messiah, how he was set apart for his ministry uh, on earth during his incarnation. So God anointed him, he set him apart, uh, in different places we read about it in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, but also in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. So for John, the anointing represents God's gift of the Holy Spirit uh, at salvation. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings with it everything that the New Testament believer needs in his life. Uh, we now have the Holy Spirit indwelling us with its potential for filling through teaching. And um, it takes place once, we said that before, and it's for every believer. These are important truths. Uh, because of our position in Christ and what we get at salvation, we have the potential to understand all, all, this, all Scripture. And we know that from John chapter 14. And verse 26, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. We have the potential to understand all things because of the anointing uh, that we have. Okay. Now, in John 2, 21, 23, 
uh, it says that I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie in um, no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is and. Uh, he's Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So John taught them the truth while he was present at, as their pastor. And they had learned the truth through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, John was involved as a teacher, human teacher. But they learned it from uh, the Holy Spirit. And the lie here is really the lie with a definite article in front of it, meaning uh, the lie that the Antichrists, they were denying that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. And of course, that is the ultimate lie because if people do not believe that, they cannot be saved. Um, and without that truth, Jesus is a worthless savior. So of course, that is the one truth that will come under attack. But in 1 John 5, 1, it says that he who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Uh, and uh, this is also the purpose statement of John chapter 20, verse 31, that the gospel of John was written uh, in order that people could understand this truth and believe and get saved. Uh, now... The um, anointing here, it also uh, says there that it, um, you are to abide. The anointing abides in you. This is the Greek word meno. And um, it always has to do with fellowship. Uh, it doesn't normally speak about positional truth, like being in, like Paul talks about being in Christ. That's our position. John often talks about abiding in Christ, which is a different word and speaks about having fellowship. It's for believers, but as a believer, I may or I may not be in fellowship. I have a relationship, but here it's about having fellowship uh, with him. So since the anointing only occurs one time, uh, can this then refer to the ongoing teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit? Uh, yes, probably it can. Uh, Paul is defining the ministry of the Holy Spirit in great detail. Uh, John is using more of an all-inclusive term. And what people try to do is like they say, think that it's like a contradicting, uh, or it's about contradicting vocabulary. Uh, and, and it's not. It's just that uh, John is more general when he's describing this thing. Paul is more detailed. So there's a lot of confusing concerning uh, this particular passage. So people try to fit John's term, anointing, into Paul's more detailed theology. Uh, in Paul's terminology, it's only when we are being filled by the Holy Spirit that our potential to be taught by the Holy Spirit is activated. This is the filling ministry spoken of in Ephesians 5.18. But John's terminology is different. We are giving everything potentially related to the ministry of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. However, the potential is only activated when we are in fellowship, rightly related to God and studying His Word. So how is this knowledge applied in our daily lives. Uh, you know, in some circles, uh, when they think about the anointing, you've probably heard this or seen this, they, they almost consider it like a thing, almost like liquid. You know, you, you, you just uh, pour something into uh, to you, uh, or, or, you know, there is the anointing, or, or you know, it's, it's treated in, in that way. Um, and we know that we have seen, you know, different locations uh, where they say, well, there is um, a revival going on, you know, a certain city and a certain church and people are going there, you know, and they experience the anointing and so on. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with these type of things, but there are some extreme cases uh, where they practice something they call gray sucking. Have you heard about that? 
they visit the grave of uh, an old pastor or, or preacher or something, and they lay down over the, uh, the grave, and they're sucking it in, uh, you know, and they think that they get the anointing. I, I know for some of you it's like absurd, uh, and it is, <laughs> rightly so, but, but it, it is true. It is true. People do... Uh, this, this is an extreme case, but hopefully, you know, more, most people are a little bit more balanced than that. But, you know, people are looking for the anointing in that sense, not knowing and understanding that, like Pastor Stevens said in the beginning of the clip here, or in the clip, that we all have an anointing. That is not, you know, we don't, we don't need to look for it. The, the, the question is whether we manifest that uh, anointing or not. Um, so, now... If we compare the text that we read in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, where Christ was sent, and he was, he was the anointed one, he was anointed for his service, and he was sent into the world. If we compare this text to Luke 4, verses 18, sorry, uh, if we compare, sorry, I'm confusing it. Uh, this is what I'm, uh, let me read it first. Uh, the text is too small. Behold, how good, I read it here instead. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing like forever, sorry, life forevermore. Um, so now, if we compare that to Luke 4, 18 and 19, where Christ was sent into the world, uh, we see how Aaron's head was anointed, and it ran down his body and saturated everything. Now think about it now. Christ is the head of the body. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. We also read about it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, we have... A position that position is in the body of Christ and he is the head so in the same way that Aaron's head was anointed and the anointing was spreading uh, all over or you know ran down his body uh, we cannot help but being anointed providing that we are finding our place in the body of Christ uh, you know, and, and this is what I like. There's nothing mystical or strange or, 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 you know, with this anointing. All New Testament believers are anointed. So finding our place in the body is key when it comes to experience the anointing. Um, so, again, we're back to the three offices that we saw in the, in the um, Old Testament where people were um, anointed the prophet, the priest, and the king. And uh, Jesus was a prophet greater than Moses, it says in Acts 3.22. Uh, Jesus is currently our high priest, having a ministry of intercession. We read about it in several places, but Hebrews 5.6 is one good place. Uh, and Jesus will be king when he returns in Revelation chapter 19 and verses 11 to 16. So... Um, we as New Testament believers, you know, we are not exactly prophets like they were in the Old Testament that we were able to, we were able to predict the future, but we are proclaimers of the truth. Uh, in um, Ephesians 4.15, we are to speak the truth in love. So in application, we are all prophets. We are to proclaim the gospel to the world. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, we are also priests. Uh, we are a royal priesthood uh, in 1 Peter 2.9. So we have a ministry of intercession, a ministry of proc proclamation, and a ministry of intercession. And then we are also kings, uh, kings and priests. It says about that in um, Revelation 5.10, uh, where I believe that the 24 elders are speaking about the glorified church. Uh, but there it says that you are kings and priests. We reign with him. Uh, we will reign with him in 2 Timothy 2.12, but also in Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 to 27. But already now, it says in Romans 5.21, that grace reign uh, 
uh, or reigns through righteousness in our hearts. Uh, what the anointing is not, uh, it looks like Greater Grace, but it's a church in, in uh, California. Uh, the, um, uh, it's called the Bethel Church. Some of you are maybe familiar with the church there. I'm not very familiar with them, but I know enough to say that the way they think, the, or what they think the anointing is, <laughs> it's not the biblical anointing. Uh, I know one of the things is that one time they had a meeting and a glory cloud showed up. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there are actually pictures on, on YouTube of the glory crowd, cloud. And, uh, you know, very strange. But so the anointing is not a mystical force that we can <laughs> feel, see, or manipulate or anything like that, or manufacture for that matter. Uh, so... Uh, Sometimes people say, so-and-so has a great anointing. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it could be true in the sense that, you know, someone is uh, manifesting the anointing. But let's take a look at uh, what I call asking journalistic questions. Pastor Steve have to confirm whether they are true or not. But uh, uh, what is the anointing? Uh, we said that it's a physical act of pouring oil on objects or people. But that is not the case for the New Testament believers. We don't have to have oil poured on us uh, because we have already been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Who is anointed? Um, well, the Old Testament prophets, the priests, and the kings. But we saw here that in the New Testament, um, in the New Testament application, uh, every single believer can be considered a prophet, a priest, or a king. And how is one anointed? Well, we said that having oil poured on their head, but again, we don't need to uh, have that done to us in order to receive the anointing. But why are people being, or why an anointing, or why being anointed? Um, it's because we need to be set apart for service, to be equipped for what God has called us to do. And this is, of course, to, to God's glory. And in that sense, uh, we all have this anointing as New Testament believers. So where were people anointed? Um, well, the priest was anointed in the tabernacle, but um, the kings and the prophets seems to have been anointed uh, in different places, not necessarily a specific uh, place. Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, how John chapter 4, uh, Jesus is meeting with a Samaritan woman, and uh, he's talking about worship, and she's saying, is it on this mountain that we worship, that we find God, or is it in Jerusalem where you worship, in the temple? And Jesus said, neither, uh, you know, because I am present here, uh, this is all you need, uh, and, and uh, you know, we are anointed wherever we are, and wherever we go, and whatever we do, uh, as long as we do it to uh, God's glory. And then finally, when were people anointed? Uh, well, it was in the beginning of their ministry, and it was only once and never to be repeated. So, how do we manifest the anointing then in, in closing here? Um, we are talking about positional truth here, being set apart, gifted for service. So, it's not whether we have an anointing or not, but whether we manifest the anointing or not. Um, and I would say that it has a lot to do with confession. Um, uh, not confession, so I'm jumping the, the gun here. Uh, it has a lot to do with personal sanctification. That's what I was trying to say, personal sanctification. And I think you remember from uh, the clip that Pastor Stephen said there in the beginning that, uh, you know, we all have this anointing as New Testament believers. Uh, and it, it's just a matter of manifesting it. And so I was thinking about that, you know, what, what are the things that we, that we need to, uh, to do? And um, confession is, of course, very uh, important. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us uh, our sins, and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And this is, of course... Uh, needed in order to be 
uh, in fellowship with God. But I'm also thinking about so repentant, uh, sorry, confession being one thing, and then submission. Think about the word submission. Uh, you have a mission underneath somebody else, you know, submission. Uh, so, you know, Christ has a ministry, and we are submitted to the head. We have a mission underneath him. So um, if I'm confessed up to date, I, I submit to him, but I also submit to other body members uh, in Ephesians 5.21. Uh, this is greatly uh, contributing to the anointing, uh, and I can experience body life. Because body life, you know, is a concept, I, that's not the topic for today, but uh, it is something very unique, I think, for our ministry. That is a distinctive... Uh, I, I'm not saying that you can not find it somewhere else, but I think that uh, we have it in, in, a, in, a, in, in a special way in our ministry, and we are thankful for that. And then you have the yielding part, you know. We, we, we're, we confess, we are submitted, we are yielded to the Spirit. Uh, this is in Romans 6, 13, and 19, and it's in contrast to yielding to sin and the flesh. So, again, the anointing, is dependent on our holy walk with the Lord, on our sanctification, you know, the yielding to the Spirit. And then, of course, obedience uh, is another thing. Uh, Romans 6, 17, um, we were not slaves to sin, but we are obedient from the heart. You know what I mean? Uh, we are obedient from the heart. And one more thing that I, I think that is very important here is also meditation. Uh, you only heard the first five minutes of the clip, but he goes into that because it's a, it was a 20 minute uh, message actually. And toward the end there, he talks a lot about uh, meditation, you know, meditating. And I, as a pastor, you know the difference between preparing a message and having it ready uh, to go. Uh, but if you have the time, you know, to just read through it and think about it and meditate on it, you know, it, it, it makes a big difference. Sometimes we don't have it, but, and God is faithful, but meditation, you know, and, and uh, Pastor Schaller is here, and I, I mean, many times I see him sitting there with this big Bible, and he only has like one verse that he's kind of focusing on, but there is meditation going on there, you know, just thinking about it, maybe asking people questions about this passage, you know, and, and just letting it sink in, you know, from thinking about it from, from different perspectives and so on. So here's my last slide uh, of, of Pastor Stevens. And, uh, you know, when we use the word, I got about seven more minutes here, so that's good. Uh, when we use the word anointed, we, you know what I mean? We, we, we have a certain, def sometimes you, you, you meet other Christians and you, you, you tell them, you say something, like a term, let's say anointing, and, and they have a totally different idea what it means. So it's, it's all, so, so we have a certain, and I, I use the word frequently, you know, I, I use the word, uh, what he or she said was anointed, you know, or, or what they did was anointed, you know, and if you, if you go to um, uh, a person that, like in a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church, um, they would, they would, talk about the anointing as uh, something like almost a thing on it, of its own, you know, like something that is sort of, uh, you, you can find it, you can, you can manipulate it, you can, you can uh, uh, direct it, you know, in different ways. And then you go to a more fundamentalist type church, you know, like a conservative Baptist church or something, and they say, well, what are you talking about, the anointing? You know, it's like, that, that's, nah, no, no, that's, that's, we have the word of God. What are you talking about, the anointing? You know, it's like, you, you have these different ideas about uh, anointing. But I, I think that what, what I, when I listen to Pastor Stevens' clip there, or the message, you know, it, it's, so, it's so balanced, you know, because the, the anointing is there. We, we need to be careful how we use the term, obviously, uh, but we don't want to shy away from it either, you know, because I, I think the way it's been taught in this ministry, uh, it is very, um, it's very good. 
And, and uh, I, I think it's, again, very unique, and we, we can learn uh, more about it. Um, and I think the reason why he, we considered him to be anointed, you know what I mean? You, you came and heard him, or, you know, this is, of course, true nowadays, too. He's not the only one, but being the founder of the ministry, uh, we, we, um, we, we, we know what we are, when we are using that term, you know, that he was anointed, uh, there, there was a special presence of God uh, there when, when he was uh, teaching. He manifested the anointing uh, because of a close walk with God. I think that is the reason. You know, it, it's not like he had the anointing. Well, he had the anointing, but so do we. We all, we all have an anointing uh, because we are New Testament believers. So that is not the question. The question is whether we manifest it or not. And we have all been set apart we have all been uh, anointed. We all have a position in Christ. Uh, so that yielded life, or the close walk with the Lord, can and will make an impact on this world and change lives. Uh, and uh, I just want to close with um, reading the reading of Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And I think I read it last night too in the message there, but it is just so good. Now, again, I'm reading from the New King James. Maybe you are familiar with some other translation, but it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. And isn't that true? I mean, there is an anointing that breaks the yoke. There, there is something there that we, we can't really figure it out, you know. But the only thing I'm trying to say here this morning is that, you know, it's not something exclusive in the Old Testament. Yes, we had the, the prophets and the priests and the kings. But in the New Testament, we are all anointed. That is our position. And in that position, we potentially have the ability to manifest the anointing. And we will do. And it doesn't matter, you know, uh, who we are um, because um, whatever we do. And, and uh, you know, if I'm a nurse or if I'm a truck driver or if I uh, work in a restaurant, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I can manifest the anointing. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, can teach me and will teach me all the truth. Uh, if, I, if I walk before him, if I live a sanctified life, because there is a connection uh, there, you know, I, I can manifest the anointing in, in a very special way, and I can make an impact. And as a ministry, you know, we, we have been anointed people going all over the world, uh, or going into all the world, um, breaking yokes uh, because of the anointing. And, and, and it is something really um, precious. I think I'll end there. Um, we have, and we'll uh, manifest the anointing because of the rich resources given to us by the head and through the head. And we are his body. And when we take our place in the body, we, we will... Uh, manifest that anointing. So, he Heavenly Father, we thank you for these thoughts. Thank you, God, for Pastor Stevens and his life and the anointing that he manifested. Thank you also, Lord, for all the people in the body of Christ, uh, in this room, in this ministry, uh, on the mission fields out there that do manifest this anointing and do make a difference in people's lives. Thank you, Lord, that we are one body. And thank you, Lord, that you are the head. And thank you, Lord, that you have been anointed. And that anointing includes us because we are your body. We just need to find our place in the body. Help us to, to find it, Lord. Help us to find our gifts. Help us to find our calling. Help us to find what you want us to do. Help us to do those things wholeheartedly as unto the Lord in Colossians 3.17 and Colossians 3.23.
Lord, we thank you, God, for the anointing, and we thank you for the teaching. We thank you, Lord, for what we have in this ministry and what you have given us historically and presently. We thank you, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. So I, need, I think you need or want 10 minutes, right, before the next session. So uh, actually, no time for questions. <laughs> I planned it that way, but no, I don't. <laughs> so, just in case you will ask something I can't answer. So. Yeah, yeah. I, it may have been a little bit technical here, but I just wanted to go through the doctrine there, you know, with the, uh, you know, like, because, you know, there are some interesting thoughts out there concerning the anointing. So I, I hope that it was well received. So thank you so much for coming and um, see you in 10 minutes. There will be somebody else here then, but, and, and another topic. Thank you. Thank you.